Gang, the coronavirus is sweeping the nation. It's planted its roots. And most scientists are saying it's not going anywhere for a while. Those nasal swab tests are hard to get and they're very expensive. Well, our friends at ProResults are doing rapid COVID-19 antibody testing to let you know if you have had the virus. They take cash or credit, no insurance needed, no doctor appointment required, and you get the results in 15 minutes. Gang, I've taken the test two times. It's painless. It's quick. It's easy. And How Did I Get Here has partnered with ProResults, offering you 15% off COVID-19 antibody testing. Just go to ProResultsAustin.com backslash H-D-I-G-H. That's ProResultsAustin.com backslash H-D-I-G-H for 15% off COVID-19 antibody tests. Go get your tests. Let's get down. Gang, we've been under quarantine for quite a while now, and it's been difficult to get together with your bandmates to do your rehearsing. If you're in a band here in Austin, it makes it very difficult. Well, gang, I have great news for you. Space rehearsal and recording is open again. They have taken extreme measures to make sure that your safety is taken care of. Masks are required. You are to bring your own microphones. But otherwise, space rehearsal and recording is open. Call them at 512 512- 4489518 or go to spaceatx.com. That's 512-448-9518 or spaceatx.com. Space rehearsal and recording. And you may ask yourself, well, how did I get here? Hello, I'm Johnny. I'm your host. Welcome to the show. I hope you guys are all doing all right. I hope you're uh, safe and healthy and sane wherever it is that you are. I hope you had a good weekend. If you had a weekend, if you do weekend stuff, I notice a lot of people are going out hiking. Some people go for drives. For a while, like back in May, I was I was taking drives out to the hill country on certain days. Yeah, I would just, you know, pick like a podcast or a record or something and just drive out. For an hour, and then turn around and come back. <laughs> Just for something to do, man. You know, this stuff is kind of, it's, it, 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 it gets maddening after a while. And I know that. I know we're all in the same boat. Even if you're working, like if you're working under these insane conditions, that would be, that would be nuts. I've been working, been keeping it from home. I didn't tell you guys this last week, but Skyrocket, we, we played uh, this corporate live stream thing on Wednesday. And uh, that was interesting. I mean, it was it was cool to get to be working again. It was cool to get to be with all the guys again and Trish and 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 see our sound lady Catherine and Kurt Gannam. We shot it over at One to One Bar. They have a five camera setup, and uh, yeah, it was it it was fun. It was fun to play with the band again. But it it was definitely weird doing a full you know energy rock band show to five cameras. Uh, so that was weird, but the people liked it. So anyway, it was fun to play with the band again. That was my first like actual gig since March, uh, 13th when I played by myself, but my first, uh, gig with Skyrocket since, uh, March 7th and Skyrocket's playing on, uh, Tuesday, tomorrow night, July 28th, we will be playing a show on stage. You can go to Skyrocket, uh, you can go to Skyrocket the band on Facebook and find a link to that. And if you are a Skyrocket fan, you can check us out Tuesday night. We're going to be doing a show from uh, our drummer Darren's living room, all kind of like semi-acoustic show. The show should be like 45 minutes, but it seems like it'll be fun. It'll be our second gig. And once again on Thursday, uh, the 30th, I'll be playing the the final, <laughs> the final, the final uh, uh, solo live stream show from my from my studio. So uh, tune in for that. That's Thursday night, 6 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Okay, that's enough uh, promoting and enough of that shit. I hope you guys are doing well. I hope you're staying safe and saying this is a crazy time. Uh, I know people are hanging on financially by their fingertips at this point. And, uh, and, and, it's, and it's brutal. It's difficult. No one knows when they're going back to work. People don't know when their kids are going back to school. We don't know when we're going to be able to get out and do stuff again and see people and hang out like we used to. If that'll ever happen again or what that's going to look like in the future. So it has been a maddening time. And, and I'm down with you guys. I have my days, you know. I get on the mics. I talk to you guys. I do the podcast. Talking to people really keeps me together. 
But like I do have my times. I have my times where I crawl up in bed and just watch, you know, six and a half hours of Netflix consecutively until I pass out or something. You know what I mean? So, yeah, you know, we're, we're all hanging in there. We're all trying to do what we do. Uh, hopefully this show is bringing you some comfort. I do have an amazing show for you guys today. Yeah. Producer, string arranger, songwriter, Jordan Lenning is on the show today. He is a second generation Nashville producer and musician. His dad was Kyle Lenning and he produced or engineered records for like Randy Travis, George Jones, Waylon Jennings. And uh, Jordan grew up going into those studios and hanging out and being like a, a second generation studio rat. And he's ended up producing records for Rodney Crowell, Andrew Combs, Caitlin Rose. He's done string arrangements for Casey Musgraves, Leon Bridges, and uh, and Burt Bacharach, who he's going to be working with again. He tells me about it during the show. But Jordan also has been putting out solo albums for, for like the last decade. And they're really, really brilliant records, man. And he's putting out this record... <clears throat> Next Friday, August 7th, it's called Little Idols, and it's a concept record, and uh, it recounts a brief a passionate affair between a single man and a married woman. Deals with all kinds of things like will and fate, right and wrong. It goes through kind of the whole thing, kind of the different emotions that happen in a situation like that. He's happily married. He's got the kids and stuff, so uh, he he explored his imagination and brought out Brought out this amazing story. And anyway, we have a great conversation, man. He is a really fascinating dude, a super cool dude who's done a lot of work on really, really amazing records. So uh, he's got his own studio, The Duck, in East Nashville. So uh, you can find him at jordanlenning.com. Uh, he's got some singles out right now. You can go find Ula Loom, which is one you're going to hear. And the Quarry song, both on Little Idols, which is out next Friday, August 7th. Check it out. So go to jordanlending.com for all of your Jordan Lending needs. And without further ado, please enjoy me and Jordan chatting it up here on How Did I Get Here. Let's get down. Okay, great. Uh, nice to meet you, Jordan. I'm Johnny. Nice to meet you, too. Uh, I'm a musician. I live here in Austin. You are a musician who lives in Nashville. You've lived there your whole life, huh? That's correct, yeah. Born yeah. and bred. Born and bred. Um, man, your record, Little Idols, it drops on August 7th, right? That's correct, yeah. That's right. It is brilliant, man. It is gorgeous. Oh, cheers. Thanks, man. Yeah, man. I went back and listened to your other, uh, your two other albums that you have on Spotify. There weren't, I, I saw that there was four in your bio or five or something. Other ones, maybe. Is that right? Uh, yeah, there's def there's two full records on Spotify okay. and there's a few EPs. Okay. All right. Well, I just heard the two full records, uh, The Jordan Sings and uh, Long Live the Dead, which I feared when I saw the title. I thought it was just a, a, a Grateful Dead tribute album by you or something. Oh, no. <laughs> no, not, not from my corner. <laughs> Me neither, man. <laughs> um, but this record, Little Idols, um, I don't know what if there's a concept behind the other two records, but this record is also like a, a musical departure a bit from those other records. So those other records are a little have a little bit more of a power pop vibe. Yeah, I think the you know Jordan sings, it, <laughs> which by the way, nice. great name for an album. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I've done so much production that I thought it was you know it's like if I make my own record, <laughs> uh, you know it's like hey he sings too. Um, uh, Jordan sings was is strictly kind of just a pop record, and um, Long Live the Dead. I just had to. Uh, exercise some demons and so that was that's what that was and 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 there's poppy happy moments about that too but but those both those records are strictly song albums you know right right a collection of songs right like regular albums like albums <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but this one uh this one you went with a, a a concept for lack of a better word how do you describe what you what what this album is 
without, I mean, uh, without sounding totally pretentious, and I almost put this in the title, but I almost <laughs> called it, you know, Little I Little Idols, a novella. But it sounds so like so Fraser Crane kind of thing. But I, you know, I got into it, and uh, that's really what it is. I mean, it really is like a short little story. It really you know? is. Mm -hmm. It is, and it it is. Uh, it's it's. Uh... I, I listened to it and then read what it was about and listened to it again and again. And then I kept hearing things in the songs uh -huh. throughout that sort of like stood out as like just j the general weirdness of it. It's basically the story of a single guy uh, having an affair mm -hmm. with a married woman. Right. And whatever comes along with that. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, the thing that, I liked about this is a really kind of private. It's an intimate record. Yeah. I really did. I wanted it to not really go. I never wanted you to meet the husband or anybody else besides these two characters, you know? Right. What made you, what made you go there with that? With the private thing about or, it? No, just with the, with the story, with that story. So if I go all the way back, I was, uh, I had an idea for a song which would be would later become Quarry Song. Okay. And I had uh, a verse and a chorus and like half of another verse. And I imagined this couple ending this affair, sort of going out where they usually go and the girls breaking up with them. And the guy's just kind of like left with that to deal with. And that's kind of the end of it, you know? And so, and I called my friend Aaron Ray and uh, Ian Fitchick to see if they wanted to come help me write it. One reason, I mean, I love Aaron and I love Ian, but I thought Aaron would sing it really well. I thought she would really kind of fit her thing. And we finished it and we cut a demo of it where she's singing it in a different key. But in my heart, I always sort of felt like it was, because in that point, she would have been, it would have been a girl with a married guy. <laughs> and for whatever reason, that's just not, that wasn't the story. That wasn't right. part of the story. Okay. And so about a year later, I had a collection of tunes. At this point, it wasn't really a concept record yet, but I had songs that were generally arranged in the same kind of way, uh, you know, sort of same instrumentation. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll clump these together and track it in one day real quick. And, and I had my friend Michael Rennie and uh, Don Billet come play bass and drums and we cut like five songs in a day and for most of the tunes i didn't have lyrics yet i just had the form and melody so it wasn't out of the realm of possibility for me to create a bigger story out of this thing right. which is a, a, eventually what i did it's interesting because that uh just that the affair the idea of the affair as a thing is is everywhere uh, today when I was listening to it, I was like, man, even like when I was watching Hamilton last week, mm -hmm. uh, even that's like a huge part of that guy's story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like they're these huge sort of like faux pas people make in the middle of a commitment that they've made. You know what I mean? Out of this insane blinding passion. Right. Now, I think something that I really try to maintain is... I think not going outside of that little bubble. Sure. You really, you really feel empathy for the guy that gets his heart broken. And yeah. I guess in Hamilton, you do, you do for the girl as well. Right. But if you just imagine Hamilton and that story as only that affair right. and really nothing else, it's a totally different story. Completely, you know? completely. But yeah, I'm just saying that the, the story of the affair is like, it's, it's, it's just on through time. As soon as somebody, as soon as the first people made a commitment, Somebody lied to somebody else, you know, sure. immediately afterwards. Since, yeah, since totally. the concept started. Yeah. Yeah. Infidelity is, uh, you know, I guess. Are you married? For me, yeah, I am. Yeah. I have three kids happily married. This is not biographical or autobiographical at all. Right, right. Um, uh, that's not to say that at some point in my life I haven't picked up something that I later would glean from this record. But, you know, the, the thing about this album. To me, it's, it's less about infidelity and more about um, this kind of serious romance between these two people. Right. right. And that just that short time period where that thing is just blooming, you know? Right. 
And in those short time periods, the world does go away to the people involved. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, also there's sort of a, a subplot in the record where um, it's during a, a flood, which is loosely based on the Nashville flood that happened about 10 years ago. Right. Um, and so they're cooped up together and the world is just kind of stopped anyway. Right. So it's just very passionate. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Intense. So d- I, did you record this record in a week? No, okay. I recorded this record in about a year. Okay, well, there was something about a week in there, and I couldn't figure out if they meant that uh, you did it. So you did it over the course of a year, in between other things. Oh, oh, the story takes place in about and then about a week. Sorry, perfect. Thank yeah. you. Sorry, that makes more mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. Um. You're 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 a very prolific producer, mm-hmm. mixer, and. And like string arranger, and I guess yeah. you play on a lot of people's records as well as a multi instrumentalist. Playing on records, I do that, but I I do more. It's mostly production and arranging and mixing. Okay, so you 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 had to do this record in between. Yeah, yeah. Which is why I guess it took a year, but well, you got a you family know, too, so like a you know you had to choose. Yeah, yeah, definitely got to choose. I mean, and I own a studio. I'm, I'm in my studio now, so and which is in my backyard. So it's I, and I'm kind of a nine to fiver. I like to, I sort of check out after a certain time, and I know when I work best. Um, and so you know, I was happy to take my time with this thing. And and when it when it started unfolding as a story record, I could have just sort of squeezed it through quickly and gotten it done. But I would, you know, I prefer to be patient with it and, you know, cut out any fat along the way. And there's there's about three songs that are not on the album. Um, and I think the records, obviously, for me, it's it's better off. But had I squeezed it out quickly, it would probably be a 12 song record. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, so you you say you're a nine to fiver. Do we, was there ever a time you were an all nighter or whatever the artist yeah. wanted to do guy? A long time ago. I, um, so my dad is a producer and, and yes. owns a studio. And before I had a studio, that's where I, I would do the graveyard shift over there. Okay. I would go, I'd work from eight until 4 a.m. most nights. Um, and I was doing a lot of stuff. I was working on a, a movie soundtrack and that's just when the studio was available. So that's when we had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, all right, well, let's, I want to know this whole story. So you're born and raised in Nashville. Your father is Kyle Lenning, who Mm -hmm. uh, is a legendary engineer and producer, worked with Randy Travis, George Jones, Waylon Jennings. You, in your own right, you have worked with with Caitlin Rose, Rodney Crowell, Andrew Combs. You've done string arrangement for Casey Musgroves, Burt Bacharach, Leon Bridges, and all, a lot more other people. Your Mm -hmm. whole family is in music. So... Like, where are you in your, in the, it, like, how many brothers do you have? I'm the youngest of four brothers. Okay. And uh, how old are you now? 36. 36. Okay. Um, all right. So, so just paint a picture of what that was like, like when you were a well, kid. Well, you know, it's like everybody, whenever you ask somebody who's in a seemingly unique situation, they always are someone, and it was, it was normal for us. So, of course. Me growing up in the studio was great. And my, my my dad never made a big deal about it. He was never sort of showboaty about any of this stuff. And we'd show up and hang out in the studio. And then if we were interested in something, he would, he would uh, you know, make sure we got the attention, you know, that that interest needed. So my oldest brother is a producer and mixing engineer and a writer, uh, Jason. And he's 12 years ahead of me. And he's much more, he was much more interested in the gear kind of stuff and production. And he's a great musician too, but my heart was more into composition and uh, I was heavy into classical at, at, at a young age and kind of out of nowhere. I mean, none, nobody else in my family really. How did, deep yeah, into that. yeah. How did you stumble across classical? So I can only think that it's because when I was really like three or four years old, my mom would read me this um, book that was about Beethoven. It was like a kid's Beethoven book. And, and then Fur Elise was sort of sprinkled in my memory there and I learned how to play it and I just got totally hooked into it. 
And then I got like his symphonies and I, I just went deep at a really young age and kind of stayed there ever since. When did you start playing an instrument? Probably about, the, you know, three or four, really young. Wow, shit, man. Not, not that it shows, <laughs> but, but I, definitely, <laughs> I definitely started playing at a pretty young age. What was the first thing? Piano. Piano, okay. Yeah. So then, that's, then you got into that classical music, and then did you study classical music for a long time? So I'm a really bad student. Um, Me too. I studied sort of like formal classical for a couple years and it just didn't take and i was a i'm uh, you know i i write you know i can write and i can read but i'm a lousy sight reader still and i was really bad when i started and i switched teachers to this guy named paul boosteaker and paul is really kind of the guy that let me guide the lessons for about 10 years and i was head you know super interested in theory super interested in and he you know and we'd always have a plan each week of like okay you got to go memorize this piano piece and i'd show up not knowing the piece but i'd have like three songs recorded on my eight track task cam, and we'd chart them out and we'd talk about the arrangement and stuff so he really was great at that and when i was about 16 i got way into shostakovich and shostakovich's string quartets and i got interested in trying to write my own and um you know that kind of started my string writing career like what what does like were you not were you not into what was happening around you in the pop culture music world or i like what was happening I, like pearl jam or something i kind of I, i've always hated the 90s and i when the 90s were happening i hated the 90s uh <laughs> radiohead i always loved yeah um nirvana great green day for you know when i was like in the fifth or sixth grade it's great uh but that's kind of it, man. I listened to a lot of, if you asked me in 1996 what my favorite artists were, I would say The Residents, um, Screaming Jay Hawkins, Thomas Dolby, Frank Zappa. I'm a really big Zappa fan. Um, and, you know, Stravinsky, Shostakovich, and Beethoven, Chopin. Yeah. Right. Did you ever get into Granddaddy? I pick up some, you know that band Granddaddy? I know the name, but I'm just not familiar okay. really with their stuff. There's a there's I think it's a similarity in your voices or something. Oh, cool! That reminds me of that. Yeah, I was a big fan of that band as well. Um, cool. So, all right. So it, you start writing these string quartets. What did you do with that? Like, so the first one, my dad said, you know, I was like, hey, I think I'm gonna try writing a quartet. He said, man, if you write it and you get it on paper the way you think what's going on in here is on paper. I'll pay for a, you know, a quartet to play it, which really was like, oh, well, yes, if, then of course I'm going to do this. And I mean, it took me about two years. The piece is about 18 or 20 minutes long. Um, but we did it, we cut it. And then from there, you know, I, I went off to Berkeley for a time Okay. when I was like 18 or 19 and I was, a, a you know, still a lousy student then. And it was sort of more in, it, it was cooler to be there because you could sit on your stoop and if you needed a French horn, you just wait for one to walk by <laughs> and then you bug them and say, Hey, can you come do this thing for a second? So, yeah, sure. So right, right. It was amazing for that. Um, and it just got this fearless sort of like, let's put, let's just start throwing all this shit together and see what happens. But you didn't graduate. No, no. Uh, when did you leave? Uh, I think I was, I was in Boston from, I think it was 03 to 05 and I stayed, I never really took a summer off. I just stayed the whole time and I just burnt out and, uh, came back to Nashville, I think 05. Okay. Uh, and so what did you do when you got back to Nashville? So in Boston, yeah. I met, um, a guy named Buddy Hewan a guy named Adam White, a guy named Adam Gold, and the three of us formed a band, and um, we were called Eureka Gold, and we made a record in Nashville one summer. We came down here to make a record and went back up to Boston, and um, Tony Berg had an imprint label under Sony, and Tony got 
a hold of our record and wanted to sign us to Sony. And we went, meanwhile, we went back to Nashville and we're playing shows and living together down here. What kind of music was it? It was rock and roll. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, among all this stuff, I was like, I would, I was sort of a, you know, play guitar. And I would play rock and roll. It was fun, it was fun to do that stuff. There's, I was in a band in that sort of like 2003, 2004 era called Endosheen. I was kind of like their keyboard player, guitar player guy. And uh, I, but we played a lot in Nashville, hung out in Nashville, and there was a really cool like indie rock scene going on there then. Oh yeah, it was great. It was a, it, it was still you know Nashville was still kind of secret, and it wasn't an it city, and it was totally um, like you wouldn't call your friends to go out. You'd just go out, and they'd they'd be there. Right. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it was a, it was a great great scene. Where did you guys play when you were around? Twelfth and Porter. Porter. And then some other places. I remember we played with uh, Kenny Loggins' son at some place that was like a warehouse kind of place there. Oh, wow. Yeah. I don't know. Um, anyway, so uh, so did you put out a record with Tony Berg? Well, t- long story short, we negotiated for a better part of a year. And um, this is when Rick Rubin... This is when Sony and Columbia were merging, right? And, and Rick, when Ruben president. was taking over, he was ta- he was had a creative chair or whatever. And Berg <clears throat> Berg went to go see Ruben and said, "Hey, I know this is happening. I'm signing this band. I want you to okay this band." And Ruben was like, "Yeah, great. Sounds great." Berg was like, "Hey, don't worry about it, guys. It's all good." But then uh, Ruben wound up dropping the label <laughs> instead of us. So sure, you can Tony was just sort of like shit. <laughs> And we all were like, shit, well, you know, I started at, at the time I was like, man, there's silver linings and all that stuff. So just keep on keeping on. Dude, uh, and a quick aside, another record that I've heard lately that's blown my mind is Z Berg's record. Tony Tony's Berg's, daughter? Yes. Have you heard this? Have no, this but record? I think I met her um, when we went there. Uh, I'll try. Who did it? I don't know who did it, man. Because now with Spotify, you don't know who's fucking played drums on. Some, you know what I mean? I know. It's awful. It's awful. It wasn't there some kind of legislation that was trying to be passed to sort of like identify people that do shit. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think for some of Spotify, you can do that, but I, it's not user friendly on either the audience or the artist end. No, it's really a bummer. What? What? I, real quick, and I mean, an aside, like what? Did, Jordan, like, I mean, you're you're a guy that, like, if 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 it was the '90s and I heard something on a record and I had a record deal, and I was like, "Shit, man, this string arrangement on this fucking Leon Bridges song is awesome," I would look in the thing and it would say your name, and I would give you a call, or I'd have my people call your people or something. Yeah. And now. Uh, yeah. You're like, oh, that string like arrangement on the thing on, on Leon Bridges' record is awesome, and you either have to spend like an hour and a half, you know, trying. Really, I don't know. really, yeah, trying trying to stay focused and not uh, forget it. There was a, um, I got a, a text from a string player that I use frequently, who's also a great arranger, and they sent me a text saying, "Hey, did you do this song by such and such? Did you arrange it?" I said, "Yeah, I did." They go, "I knew it. I knew it was you." And they go, somebody just somebody just hired me to do a thing and wanted it to sound just like that. I was like, <laughs> how did they ask me to do it? Well, because that person anyway. probably couldn't find you. Right, exactly. God, man, that's so weird. It's weird because I was about to ask you, then I remembered how you grew up because I was like, I was a kid that grew up. I was a kid that like, I mean, I'm 51, but like I, my, my mom, we had records. We listened to records, new records that came mm-hmm. out. Like I knew Russ Kunkel played drums on Jackson Brown's record. You know what I mean? Totally. I, I knew who Jim Keltner was because I was seeing his name on all these records that I liked, you know, when I was a kid and just things like that. Like, what what was that like growing up with those kind of guys, like, around you? Like, well, not, you not know, necessarily those exact names, but those those the Nashville version of those dudes. In full disclosure, I was I'm not a huge connoisseur of the stuff that my dad made but i'll or really country music for that matter um but i'll go back 
and listen to stuff and go, oh my God. There, you know, so my dad, he, he recorded a, I'd really love to see you tonight. That was like his one of his first oh, big. Oh, really? Yeah, it was one of his first big breakout hits. And he was like 26 or something when he did it. And um, I was watch, I was in the theater watching Anchorman 2. And this guitar starts strumming. And I go, shit, that sounds good. And it keeps playing. <laughs> and it keeps going. I'm like, Jesus, this sounds awesome. And it sounded new to me, too. It also sounded like somebody kind of doing a retro version, but just really hi-fi. And then it got to the course. It's like, oh, shit. <laughs> it's like, that's how little I know of that stuff. But that being said, I was more, I, you know, knew those guys personally. And the musicianship thing was always like, you know, the seat, the threshold was always very high. Right. And you could sort of sniff out. I could sniff out at a pretty young age musicians that were not that great, that were okay, but not great. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably the only difference. Otherwise they were just good. You know, they're all funny. Yeah. You know, affable dudes. Was there something about that life? that you that attracted you to it like seeing it at such a young age like uh, you know there's something about the life like walking into a room there's a way when you're a kid and you see grown people that act like children and still make dick jokes and stuff when they're you know totally. in their 30s you're like oh how do i get how do i be be part of this thing i definitely knew from a young age that i did not want to wear a suit you right. know for the the last half of my life, you know, three quarters of my life. Um, and yeah, it did. My, my dad's a really easygoing guy. He's funny. And everybody in the studio was always really comfortable. And music was, uh, it was almost like the environment was first and music was second. You know, you make sure everybody's happy and then good stuff will come from that. I, I really try to take that too and do that same thing. Yeah. That's one of those things that you learn as you get older as a musician uh, that the hang is, you know, one of those things where you take a a, a less virtuosic, a virtuosic or virtuoso bass player with you on tour that was super cool to hang with, than a virtuoso asshole. You know and, what I mean? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. All right, so let's go back. Uh, Eureka Gold. That's that thing kind of fell apart, but you were still, what else were you doing at that time? So that was Oh five. My brother, Eric, I'm gonna, I'll tell you all the brothers. Okay. There's Jason. Who's the oldest. Uh -huh. He's a, he's a producer and a mixer and engineer and a writer. Okay. He's great. Uh, there's Ryan who is a copyright lawyer for sound exchange. Oh, cool. We call him the, the white sheep of the family. He's <laughs> the only one that has like a real job. Um, and he's up in DC. And then there's Eric, who is a fantastic singer, a really incredible lyricist, a writer, great visual artist. And he's here in town. And he and I did a ton of collaborating growing up. Um, and then there's me. So Eric was working on this movie called Make Out with Violence. Um, this is now, God, this is now 15 years old. But I was doing the score for it okay. and that took a really long time and and i was right me eric and i were writing songs for this movie while production we were sort of just dishing out tunes and letting them use it as inspiration um and that music would later form a band called the non-commissioned officers and those guys uh which for a little while i wasn't even in because i was still in boston when that was percolating and starting and then i moved back to nashville and joined the group that band sort of went on for three years and had a short life after the movie had come out um but i was doing that uh you know just waiting tables in nashville R incredibly broke um and you know doing um doing terrible things that young 20 you know year old guys do and playing in, in a band it was it was great it was also miserable you know yeah <laughs> yeah so uh so what what how did you how did you end up in the studio like producing bands like how did all of that end up happening? so as i said you know i had it sort of took the graveyard shift and you know for for as much as i partied and did crazy stuff i worked really hard too and i would wait tables and i would 
be serious about having output. And so I was working on, um, I was working on uh, Eureka Gold stuff, non-commissioned officer stuff. And then I would have my friends who were making music come in and I would just record it for mm-hmm. free. Or I would say, Hey, I'll do this and I'll own half the masters and yada, yada. And because of doing the movie so much, and these guys were really demanding. I'm at on the soundtrack of the movie. There's 44 songs. It's a double disc. Jesus. It's what? a massive. Who was in that movie? I don't know. There's. Well, you wouldn't. Um, <laughs> it, the, the movie did for, you know, for an independent movie, it did pretty well. Okay. Um, I'll send you a link to it later, but uh, it's a big record. And outside of that, I mean, there must be 12 or 15 other songs that were just trials that got kind of thrown away. So I got into the habit of making music really fast, good quality, really, really quickly. And so I'd have people come over and we'd just mess around with stuff. And um, I was working. This is, I mean, I could go really broad with this if you want, how deep this goes. But uh, when I came back to Nashville, Go Eventually, deep, I started seeing a girl named, huh? Go deep, man. All right. Yeah. I started seeing it. I started seeing Caitlin Rose. Her and I became friends. We started seeing each other. And I wrote a song, um, actually, about another relationship called uh, uh, Things Change. And that's really what introduced us. I wrote Things Change, and I thought that girl, Caitlin Rose, would sound great on this. And so I, I had her over, and we recorded it, and then we sort of wound up you know, just spending more time together. Um, And then she went on to make, I tried to make this album with her, but we were breaking up when that was beginning. And it was like, this is not functional. And in that time period, I met a guy named Skylar Wilson and Skylar and I uh, started, we, first of all, we really became fast friends. He's a, he's still one of my best friends. Um, And Skylar had just done the Justin Towns Earl record, Midnight at the Movies. Right. And um, isn't that what it's called? I think so. Yeah, it was about 10, 12 years ago. Um, and Skylar and I started making, for lack of a better word, jingles. Uh-huh. And quickly made a lot of money doing that. And so I was able to, I'd already kind of quit my, you know, sling and hash job and, uh, and suddenly I had some money and, um, and, you know, throughout this whole time I was, I was producing more, producing more, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't until later that, you know, I had made money. I met my wife or soon to be wife. We, uh, she became pregnant with our first son. We bought a house on the East side and, um, Caitlin and I had then started, I wrote another song called Everywhere I Go. Now, this would have been three years later or something like that. Um, and I wrote that and thought, shit, Caitlin would sound great on this. But her and I were not talking at the time. And the night that I wrote that song, I went to the Mercy Lounge and she was there. And I had enough drinks to go up and sort of cordially say, hey, I've got a song in my pocket that I think you should sing. And I told her a little bit about the song. And that started the new dialogue that would later turn into uh, the stand-in, which is a, the record I did on her that Skylar and I both did on. Dude, that literally sounds like an episode of that show, Nashville. <laughs> oh, no, seriously, right? <laughs> like the whole thing. <laughs> I know it's ridiculous. Man, that is awesome. So, uh, so did that? When did you build it? The studio is called the Duck. Yes, but we did not. It was not here that we tracked okay. it. We tracked it with Eric Massey at the casino, okay. um, just on the street. But uh, this was this is about three years old, I think, okay. um, and it's an in constant shift. You know, I, I sort of finally got it to where it all feels good, and and uh, I don't have to do too much for any. You know, if there's a string section coming in, it's I'm not pulling my hair out. If it's a band, I'm not pulling my hair out. It's it's all kind of set up and ready to go. Right. So, um, so when you started producing, what do you like, I know people have different feelings about this and I have had different feelings about it as well as a producer, but do do you like working with solo artists or do you like working with bands? 
I don't like working with bands. Um, <laughs> solo artists are so much easier to talk to communicate with. Right, right. And you don't have to go down the line. And the problem, you know, if, if it is a band, you need there to be the guy or the girl that's mm -hmm. like, they're the leader and that's the one you talk to and everybody else follows suit. I did. So I've, I've been in both situations where I've, I recorded a band that was incredibly difficult because the, the lead singer just didn't have the balls to, he would like make me shit, make, make me say stuff right, right, right. that he was saying, like, just, just tell, tell these people. Yeah. Uh, but um, I recently worked with a band who was, who were great. And I, I thought for sure it was going to be, I thought I was like, man, what am I walking into? This is going to be a nightmare. And they're all a bunch of hippies, so sort of smelly hippies. And, and they, they were amazing. I, I became really good friends with them and they are the funniest people I know. And uh, it was a real joy to make that record. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So you never know. I mean, you, and then you get one artist that'll, that'll drive you totally insane and you wish you had somebody else to throw the football. Yeah. To. So it's just a, you know, but I think, at the end of the day, I'd prefer to work with an artist over a full band. Yeah. How did you end up working with uh, uh, with Rodney Crowell? What record did you do of his? So I did, me and Kim Bowie of New West Records did uh, Close Ties. Okay. Um, and Rodney, Rodney had just written a book, an autobiography, and he had an editor, and the editor really threw him around and made him do stuff that he wouldn't normally want to do. And when he went in to do close ties, he typically would produce his own stuff. And when he went in to do close ties, he talked to Kim and said, Hey, I want you to produce this next record on me. And she's like, ha ha, that's, you know, that's funny. And he's like, no, I'm serious. And he sort of explained to her that he had an editor and he needed an editor for this record. Mm -hmm. And so Kim later called me cause I had done, I had done Kate, and I had done Andrew Combs's record uh -huh. that, and Kim wound up signing Andrew and doing that. And her and I became fast friends too. And she asked me to be musical director, which is, you know, it's, that's fine. I'll, I'll take that role. And so I later went in and it was going to be Kim and Rodney producing. And we did a one rehearsal and Rodney came up to us after the rehearsal and said, man, I'd like for you guys to co-produce this. I'm not going to produce. He says, you'll know my opinion about stuff. So I don't, I don't necessarily need to be producer. So you guys can co-produce. So that's how it happened. It was great. Great fun. Wow. What do you think that you, uh, like their producers all have like different strengths. You know, some of them are badass musicians. Some of them are badass songwriters. You know, I don't know exactly what Andy Warhol did on that. Velvet Underground album with the banana on it, but whatever he did, if even if it was just sitting around saying something was cool or something wasn't, like different producers have different strengths and bring something different to the table. What do you think yours is? What do you think people are looking for when they come to you? Um, in working with other producers, a difference that I've noticed, I don't know if it's really a strength, but it's something that I, when, I, when I've worked with other producers and I wish they would do a thing, mm -hmm. Sometimes that is, um, th I, I have pretty, uh, my ears are pretty big. If there's something wrong, I can kind of pinpoint it, identify it and take it out and fix it. Yeah. Um, I'm paying close attention to how something is being engineered. Uh, and I try to stay really calm and be empathetic to the artists. If they throw a loop, if they throw me for a loop, you know, I try not to, lose my cool and you know there's this there was a i'm currently working on a new caitlin rose record and over so you know how however many years we've been trying to do this i used to kind of would go crazy she would and she's an old buddy of mine too so it's like right. you know eventually I'm, I'm used to blowing my stack with her <laughs> right right <laughs> but, but but that you know that would be fine sort of just to and you know over at lunch but right. if you're in the studio and you do that it's not good yeah so um i try to be empathetic and i you know and i do a lot of fat trimming if there's something in a song that has no like why is this there uh let's take it out and it 
or if the song's bad, it's like, why are we doing this? You know? Yeah. Who are some of your, your, uh, your, the producers that you, that you look up to? Uh, did your dad gosh, have a pretty like, big effect on you? Totally. Yeah. But yeah. And you know, I worked for him for a while when I first moved back or about a year or two after I moved back to Nashville, I, I wound up engineering for him and I learned a lot in doing that. And I got to work with really amazing people. I mean, I was, I was, I did stuff with Fred Foster before Fred died. Wow. Um, Ray Price. Wow. Uh, Kenny Rogers, who was yeah, amazing. I saw you did a couple of records with him. Yeah, Kenny was incredible. Um, you know, and there's a there's a string arranger named Bergen White, who we just Google him. He's he's on everything. He's old school. He did he did a chart for Elvis back in the day, and Bergen's like my hero. I I love Bergen. So, um, you know, the where production styles cross. I think dad, dad is also really patient and um, he's musical. He's a really musical guy. He can kind of hear, he can hear uh, stuff that he doesn't like and he knows why he doesn't like it. And he knows how to communicate that. Right. All with, you know, comfort and ease. Yeah. There seems to be, at least on, on, uh, on little idols, I feel like there's a, a bit of, uh, uh, from the same family tree as like John Bryan. Are you a fan of his? Big time. Yeah. Bryan is a, especially in, in the nineties, you know, a uh, huge influence. Yeah. Um, that was something that I, that always really appealed to me, his production style. And that, that first Rufus Wainwright record. Totally. I would really lump that into like little idols to me is a, you know, a marriage between that record and, um, Nick Drake's Pink Moon or, or a Nick Drake record. Really. Right, right. Those string arrangements on those Nick Drake records are fucking unbelievable. Yeah, who was that? I don't know. I can't remember. He I was amazing. Know. Yeah. Yeah. I just listened to, uh, was it Five Leaves Less Left? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and that, they really Riverman. stood out to me for that, on that record. Oh, they're amazing. Yeah. He only did like two or three records, right? Yeah, yeah. I knew this guy that lived here for a while named Ian Matthews. He mm -hmm. was in, uh, ah, shit. I can't remember, but it's some folk, like, you know, famous folk band from the late 60s, early 70s. But, um, oh, Fairport Convention. Okay. But he told me that in the, in the, whenever in the era of Nick Drake, they had the same manager. And, oh, wow. And that he was around him a few times and that he was a real bummer. Like he that was a sucks. real, like a real drag, like a very sad person. So that's so that, that sucks, man. Yeah, but what a beautiful musician. Yeah, you yeah. hate. I hate to, you know. There's so many guys that write dark music that are really humorous. Yeah, sort of lighthearted individuals, and you hate to hear the ones that 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 are just both. Yeah, They're just dark both sides. Well, it's funny because there's different kinds of songwriting and that, you know, you talking about, obviously there are things from your own life that might inform anything in one of the songs, like even on your new record, but that's not your story. You're not a guy that went out and, and, and had this crazy situation go down and then came back and wrote a record about it. Like a lot of no. people do. Is, is there a time when you've been that kind of like personal songwriter? That's almost like a journal Yes, but I was, I think I was way more cryptic. Um, oh, yeah. I would, I would, yeah. And it was, you know, it was early on when we could play to, you know, people in Nashville and it, it didn't matter. It was, no, it was, there was no consequence. And even now, like my life is, again, I'm a nine to five. I like, I like a normal life. I have three kids. I, you know, we're, we're still kind of lockdown mode right now. So I'm not like going out and, and the relationships I do have are just friends and it's not all that, uh, juicy. Right. Right. Uh, and if it were, I'd be miserable and I would sort of feel, you know, too guilty to write anything. Right. But there, there's songs like there's people like you'd hear, like, I mean, there's there, like I'm a Nick Lowe fan and there've been mm -hmm. years where I, I, you know, for years I thought like, man, he's really, woof. Man, I can't believe you made it through that. You know, stuff like that. And then I listened to this fucking interview with him. He's like, "Oh no, I make everything up, man." And I was like, 
<laughs> a little bit of the bubble was burst, but then I just thought of him as a crafts. It's it's interesting because where you live, there's the art of songwriting. There's the inspiration of songwriting. There's the whatever kissing God on the mouth aspect of songwriting where you're touched by something. And then where you live, like it's like a factory of like craftsmanship. Do, do That's you- right. I, I mean, yeah, that, that's totally true. And for me personally, because, you know, I'm, I don't have a publishing deal and I don't think I want a publishing deal. I'm not, if I'm writing for other artists, it is just complete fabrication. But for this, you know, I got way into watching Ingmar Bergman in those movies and I just love the tone of that stuff and the stillness of those things. So for little idols, when it was, when it became clear to me that it was going to be this story, I could really go deep into that story and just write it. And it wasn't like, well, I guess I got to get up and go write this fiction today. It was like, no, this is going to be really interesting. Right. You know, Um, now there definitely is that where you're writing with somebody else for some artists and it feels a little, um, it's just icky. I don't, I don't like the way that feels, but unless it's a great song and it speaks, you know, to a lot of different people for different reasons, then, then it's great. But, um, you know, and there's, there is other stuff that I'm, I'm now I'm working on this new album that I've, uh, that I started 10 years ago and I'm finally getting done with it. And the mean, and this is sort of a kind of another concept record, but it's meaning has shifted in the duration to something now that I sort of, I, in hindsight, I can really, latch onto it and it is autobiographical but i'm putting it in sort of this other uh world of uh how it's going to be presented so it's you know there's a million ways to do it yeah yeah definitely let me ask you a question about like your own artist career like you say you're a nine to five or you have time for your family do you play shows like if this if we weren't under lockdown would there be a record release show for little idols no and i'm going to tell you why because one i don't like going to shows i don't even like being in the audience it's it's a very rare occasion that that i'll go see something and i'll have a unique experience really rare um two the record i've spent so much time on making that record sound the way it's supposed to be for me to rehearse a band pay them and then you know get on stage after spending time even one show doing it for 30 minutes and then it's over and it didn't sound like the way you wanted it to sound and it's like why didn't i just play the album just play the record i mean it's the idea of like uh you know a hitchcock movie or or something you know like a wes anderson him having to take that on the road right right yeah and um, like a, in 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 like uh in like junior high cafeterias yeah yeah I that's know. not the movie yeah yeah no that's um, not the movie so, and that's just not, you know, I sort of have the luxury of not, I don't have to do that. Right. And, and I love, I'm not interested in that format. I love the respect to the art too. Like you don't want to diminish this thing that you've made. And I, I really, there's not a lot of people that are that respectful to their art. <laughs> well, and you know, a lot of, I think the normal artist wasn't able to afford to not go on the road. They have to right. go do it. Course, but because yeah. I have... This is not, I don't even, you know, I don't look at this as making income. This is just something that I'm, I'm going to do yeah. and, and release and not have to worry because I don't have to worry about that end of it. I'll, I can do it however I want to do it. You know? Yeah. Did you do it for the other records that were more rock and roll? No. No. <laughs> Play shows? Yeah. No. Uh, I got my, so Ian Fitchick is on Jordan Sings. It was Ian Skylar was there. Um, we cut it at Eric Massey's, and my buddy Eli Beard, and they were all like, "We should play this. You just go play a show." And I was like, "Ah, you know, was, that I I could have seen doing that because it's pretty simple um, rock and roll." But yeah, this is a know. little more complex. This would be a little more difficult. Yeah, and again, it's the rehear- it's the setting up and the getting there, and then you're you just have you have this euphoric thing for thirty minutes, and then it's over. It's like this is, that was kind of painful, dude. I still do it all the time, and I've been. I mean, I'm fifty one. I've been doing this since I was fourteen, but I still there's there's those of us that still like like there's still 
I still get excited going into a place when it's not open yet and they're turning on the lights and it smells weird. And I totally respect and appreciate that. Yeah. I really appreciate it. It's just not, I just, it's never drawn. It's not, it's not my thing. (laughs) Well, it doesn't need to be this, this record you made really is brilliant. You're a fucking great songwriter and such a great singer. And, and I hope that, I hope that you keep on making albums and putting them out and, uh, and your work as an arranger and producer is really great. You're, you're just fucking awesome, man. Let me ask. Oh, you. cheers, man. Yeah, sorry, that was a weird way to come out. It sounded sounded like a weird fan <laughs> guy, but I'm a musician too. And like when I, it's same thing when I heard that Z Berg record. It kind of effect. You should listen to. It. I think you'd. I think you'd really like it. Um, cool. I had that same effect where I was just like same thing like when you listen to something beautiful that John Bryan's done. You know, even like the I Heart Huckabee soundtrack or something. Yeah. We're just like, shit, man, this is like, gives me goosebumps even just talking about it. Yeah. 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 It's really, that stuff's really, it's really good. There's, there's still good stuff out there. Yeah. Hey, uh, let me ask you, are you friends with Mike McCarthy? Do you know, are you Facebook friends with him? No, Mike, but I am not close with him. Okay. He used to live here. I worked with him a lot. Oh, that's right. He does a lot of stuff with Frank, right? Frank Liddell? Uh, I think so. I know that um, he did somebody big. My cousin was just telling me the other day, but he did like a you know started out like doing the Spoon records and did like a couple of Patty Griffin right. records and. Mike's really good. Yeah, he is really good. He taught me. I'd learned a lot from him. I learned probably seventy five percent of my engineering from him, and the other seventy five percent from like cassette four tracks. That's what's and, up. And eight tracks, yeah. Yeah. So you have the Tascam yeah. 488. That's the eight track cassette. Oh, you have hold it on. there. Yeah. Hold on. How cool are you? Fuck yeah, dude. And I've got it rigged up. You know, it's, it's it works. For a long time, the transport didn't work, but I've got it rigged up just to use the um, the pre's as a drum crusher. I'll brief it's, tour of the studio. Yeah. Uh, you know what? That is an amazing thing. I had a uh, I had a Tascam three eighty eight, the one that has the reel to reel in the window thing. You know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So the drums are up there, and then I just got a mono crush up there for that. Yeah, that is awesome. But yeah, I ran a lot of stuff through those pre's on that Tascam. Once I started recording digitally and stuff, I still used it because oh, yeah. I love that compression and the distortion. You can't beat the distortion. No. No. Is there anything you're listening to now that that blows your mind or anything you've been working on that you're like, oh, this this record's coming out should be good? What's that hippie band? Uh band called Banditos. Okay. Uh Man. they're great. Uh and whatever was on or whatever is on Spotify now is not representative of what we did. Okay. Um they're great. Their record's really good. I'm really proud of it. They're fun, fun people. The songs are totally cool. Um Caitlin, Caitlin's record, I think is really good. Um, I could sort of talk for three hours about that, but I, th- I think that record's really good. I'm excited for it to see the light of day. And uh, I just did a new record with an artist named Lydia Luce, uh-huh. and we're finishing that up. Um, and other than that, you know, I'm just I just got a call from Daniel Tashin about some more Burt Bacharach tunes. So man, that but, is awesome. It's crazy. That is so exciting. Do you get to meet him or do you do you, you do? Bert, Bert yeah. came here. Oh, wow. Bert, he's like, well, I mean, it's, it's not going to happen this round, but we did um, two days. Eventually, I'm going to write a short thing about this because it was such a, it was kind of amazing. Um, Bert's like 92, 91 or 92. And um, we did two days at my studio, a Saturday and a Sunday. And Bert likes to start in the afternoon and work late. And so we started at two and ended around eight or eight thirty. And it was amazing, man. Uh he is sharp as attack, is incredibly musical, is is a uh, you know, he doesn't look fifty. He looks you know, he looks his age, but yeah, yeah. his he is so, so with it. And um whatever factory that he had going in the sixties and seventies is the exact same factory. His stuff is, he thinks about it the same way he respects every follicle 
of a piece of music. I mean, it's, it's astounding. It was astounding. That's amazing. I love that dude. What a, what an honor to get to work with him, man. It was, I, I, yeah, I could I could have quit after that. I was like, all right, I'm good. Yeah. And that was just, you know, that was just when we were arranging, that wasn't even the, um, the tracking date, but that it was incredible. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I'm glad you're doing well and that you're still able to work. I saw you posted the, uh, the engineer in normal life and the engineer under quarantine. It's the same actual photo. Your life hasn't changed that much. How right. are your kids? Um, my oldest is eight, about to be nine. My middle is five, about to be six. And my youngest is two, about to be three. Wow. Are any of them music people yet? I think they all have an, uh, an inherent thing. And it's a big regret of mine that I've not been better about fostering that and nurturing that. It's really, it's difficult to do. Um, I, I have it in my mind how I want to do it and I'm not ready to do that. Yeah. Um, but when, when this quarantine started, we were do, trying to do a daily sort of quick 15 minute music lesson. And, you know, I have this, I have this idea that you don't have to, play an instrument to understand theory right and i think that would be a really good way to initiate them so that they had no fear of the interface of an instrument going in they already kind of had a core understanding about it um which sounds good that's a really smart uh, technique is that is that is that something that people do or did you make that up i don't i as far as i know i made that up but that but i'm i'm not putting a patent on it quite yet um you should but i just you know it's more about it's more about understanding it you know and the number system is really easy for anybody to understand you know you just kind of have to know a scale and not a count and you're off to the races yeah i like the number system i had to have it explained to me just because i've not been like a studio cat until my older age unless you know someone asks you to come in and play on a song specifically and you know what you're doing you know but like right. going in and playing on a record and like Someone puts a thing of numbers in front of you and you're like, hey, what's a seven? And they're like, oh, man, that depends on what key you're in. And then everyone in the session looks at you weird. And then the guy takes you outside and you come back and you're like, I get it. I just didn't know <laughs> yeah, this right. is how it worked. <laughs> I, I'll tell you who doesn't do it is Bert Backrack. Bert, we were sitting down and I was explaining to somebody. We were this during the session. I was explaining to somebody something in numbers. And Bert was like, I never got the numbers. I still don't know the numbers. <laughs> Okay. I was like, really? I was like, you know, he's like, if, if it's C, that if you're in C, that's one. He's like, yeah. And I was like, and you know, then you go A minor at six, and he goes, he just shakes his head. <laughs> like, but you think about, you think about Bert's music, and had he done the number system, it could have totally deflated wherever his brain wanted to go because yeah. his music is really not suitable for numbers. It's got to be letters because he's very chromatic. He's all over. Yeah place you know yeah yeah what an amazing dude well i hope you have fun doing that record and people can find little idols it'll be out on august 7th you got two singles out right now um uh god what did i write that down Ulalu and uh and little lies right mm -hmm. and uh those are available now wherever you stream and download your music you can go to jordanlenning.com you can also see uh fabulous photos of the duck your your beautiful studio and uh and yeah is there anything else i'm missing i don't think so i think we covered it man yeah man it's been really great talking to you i'm a huge uh, fan a of yours. i'm uh definitely Cheers, gonna man. uh gonna stay in touch and if if i'm ever able to have like your get you to do some string shit i totally would you know my number yeah well thank you so much man thank you brother and I can't think of any but you to sing with me now ooh la -lu. Producer, string arranger, singer-songwriter Jordan Lenning, man, what a great conversation. His gorgeous new album, Little Idols, drops next week, August 7th. Get it. Go to jordanlenning.com for all of your Jordan Lenning needs. What a great conversation. I'm excited to hear whatever he's going to be doing with the great Burt Bacharach coming up. That's exciting. That's just exciting. I really enjoyed talking to him. What a talented man. I love this record. Everyone get out there and check it out. You can hear his other records as well. Uh, 
uh, Long Live the Dead and Jordan Sings. These songs are out there. They're great records. And, of course, Little Idols dropping August 7th. Gang, when you're out there checking out jordanlenning.com, don't forget that you can subscribe to this podcast wherever it is that you find podcasts. Be it Spotify, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Overcast, Stitcher, anywhere you find podcasts, new shows all the time. We're dropping five shows this week, gang. <clears throat> Why do I do this to myself? I don't know, but that's what I'm doing. Let's hear the rest of this great song, Ooh La Loom, from the album Little Idols by the extremely talented Jordan Lenning. Have a great week, gang. Stay healthy, stay safe, stay sane. Let's get down. Secret tune, one, two, baby, ooh la loom. Shut your eyes and show your bruise Sing it gently, ooh la loom Till we're pushing up daisies, me and you Bye bye baby, ooh la loom